Good morning, church. It is so good to be with you this morning. Welcome to New Heights Bentonville. We're really glad you could join us in your living rooms, in your kitchens, wherever you are today. Uh, welcome to, to all. And I want to say Happy Mother's Day. It is great to celebrate our mothers our, and mothers of all kinds, our biological mothers, our spiritual mothers. Um, maybe there's a woman who came into your life at just the right time and, and served a motherly role. Uh, those longing to be mothers, expecting to be mothers, um, we recognize you and are so thankful for you guys today. Uh, again, we're so glad to be with you. Welcome. Uh, hey, if you want to say hi in the comments, whether you're on Facebook or on YouTube, please let us know you're here. Send your comments, send your pictures of you, your family, whoever you're worshiping with this morning. Uh, and as well, there's always the resources at nhbittenville.com. So you can press pause to either gather your communion elements for later. Um, you can look at some lyric sheets or other things that we'll be doing um, later in the service. You can find those at nhbittenville.com. We're really excited to worship with you today. And what an honor and joy it is to gather still in this way, united in spirit as the body of Christ. Uh, I'd love to start us out in a call to worship. And I invite you guys to, to read this together. If you want to stand, um, you can, we can read this aloud together. It's from Psalm 117. Praise the Lord, all nations. Glorify him, all peoples. For his faithful love to us is great. The Lord's faithfulness endures forever. Hallelujah. Amen. Let's worship together. You were the word at the beginning. One with God, the Lord Most High. You hid in glory in creation, is now revealed in you, our Christ. What a beautiful name it is! What a beautiful name it is! The name of Christ my King, what a beautiful name it is, nothing compares to this, what a beautiful name it is, the name of Jesus. You could have had heaven without us. Jesus, you brought heaven down. My sin was great, your love was greater. What could separate us now? What a wonderful name it is. What a wonderful name. to this what a wonderful name it is the name of Jesus death could not hold him sing it out church death could not hold you the field tore before you you silenced the most of sin and grave the heavens are roaring of your glory for you are raised to life again no you have no rival you have no equal now and forth 
here to stand against What a powerful name it is The name of Jesus What a powerful name it is The name of Jesus What a powerful name it is The name of Jesus where I run the fountain I dream from oh is my song let the king of my heart be the shadow where I hide the ransom for my life oh is my song you are good good oh you are good, good. Oh, sing that. You are good. You are good. You're good. Oh, you are good, good. Oh, let the King of my heart be the wind inside my sails. Anchor in the waves, oh, he is my song. Let the king of my heart be the fire inside my veins, the echo of my days, oh, he is my song. And you are good, good, oh, you are good.
Church, I'd love for us to, to move into this time of confession and assurance. Uh, I'd love for you guys to read along with us at home. Uh, again, you can find this on the, the website, or it might be in the comments on either YouTube or Facebook. Uh, this is a holy moment to refresh ourselves, uh, to remind us of our need for God and his grace, for our need for a king, uh, of king, king Jesus. So let's read this confession together. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. Hear the words of Jesus, church. Where are those who accuse you? Is there no one to condemn you? Neither do I. Go and sin no more. Good morning, church. I am Tim. I uh, get to serve you here as one of the elders at New Heights Bentonville, so welcome this morning. I um, wanted to enter into a time of worship through giving, but first I wanted to welcome you. If you're a visitor to us, whether you searched for us on, on YouTube or if maybe you were looking at some, some new cat crazy cat videos and just happened to stumble on us, we, we want to thank you for joining. We hope you stick around um, and just ask you to just sit back and enjoy, uh, enjoy this time. But I would say, um, to start out, I want to read Philippians 4.19. It's a great reminder for us. God will meet all your needs according to the riches of his glory in Christ Jesus. So as we're, as we're all fighting with our, our own minds, oftentimes with fear and those sorts of things, we have to remember all our needs are met in, uh, in Christ. So in, in giving, in this time, we have been amazed to see how generous our body is. You are so generous. You've been giving. You've been seeing God's blessing in your life, and so we just pray that you would continue that. We have a plethora of ways to give, so all of them are there. You can find them on the website, and so we just ask that you would continue to do that and be blessed in, uh, in the giving. Um, I would say for a, from an announcements perspective, we have a couple of exciting things going on. Um, we do have discovery sign up starting, and so as you know, that's a nine-week course where you're able to go through with a group of of people to, it's a first step in community at New Heights, as well as you get to learn about our history, what we're about, what we believe, who we are. Um, we have uh, some groups just finishing that up via Zoom. They've done really well. They've enjoyed it. So we don't know, you know, hopefully this will be able to be live with everybody together, but if not, then, you know, God can use that too. So um, go into the comment section. There's a link there to sign up for that. And then on May 16th, we have a work day scheduled here at the church. Um, and, you know, we're here in the, in the new space right now. Um, still a lot of work to be done, and uh, we had one very successful work day. We have another one coming up, and so if you go into the comment section, you can find that sign up there as well, so we can come in, do some painting, be able to see what's going on and be a part of it. So thank you. Um, let me pray real quick, and we'll, uh, we'll get rolling. Father, thank you for your love. Thank you that you have been able to meet all of our needs in Christ Jesus. You are so very good. God, we pray for Josh. We pray that you would speak through him. We ask, Holy Spirit, that you would guide his words, that you would let it come out clearly, that you may be honored. Thank you, Father. Amen. Good morning. How's it going? Welcome. So glad to be here with you again today. Again, I can't see you. I'm staring at a camera screen, but you can see me. And so wave if you're online, say hi, do those emoji things. Uh, we are happy to be here with you again today. The thing that I've been amazed about during this season is the resiliency of the body of Christ, how even though we have not been able to gather together corporately like we often do, we are still connected as a body. And I love that this weekend there were several volunteers and members of our church who delivered communion to different homes of, of people who are in our body. If, if you weren't on that list and you want to be on that list, then put your name in the comment section. We'll do that as well. 
Uh, but it, it's been amazing to see Christians become the body of Christ, which is kind of an ironic thing, but it, sometimes it takes a pandemic in order for that to happen. So, hey, we're, we're, we are continuing a series we've been in today called The Story of Scripture. And in this series, what we're doing is giving you like this 30,000 foot overview of the whole story of the, the grand sweep of the Bible from Genesis all the way to the maps. And, and what we're trying to do, the goal, I'm just reminding you where we've been, the goals of this series is to give you an orientation to God's Word, uh, to know uh, wh what is going on as you open it up, to form some kind of biblical literacy as you approach the Scriptures. I don't know about you, but when I, when I confront something or come to something where I don't feel oriented or comfortable, I, I tend not to do it. And we want you to feel comfortable as you look at the scriptures, as you study kind of where we're at in the timeline of biblical history and to form some biblical literacy there. And the second thing is we want you to see Je like Jesus is all over the Bible. The Bible is not really this book of, 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 if you're watching and you think Christianity is this list of rules on how to live your life, you have missed the message of the gospel. And I want you to hear it today. So stick around. You're going to hear what the gospel is. It's the story of a person, and his name is Jesus. And like my kids' children's Bible says, every story in the Bible whispers his name. That's why we're doing this series. And so I want to give you kind of this, this uh, the summary of where we've been. I think it's important to orient again where we've been so we can know where we're going. And so several weeks ago, we started this series, and we started with the prologue, which was Genesis 1 through 11. The first 11 chapters of the Bible kind of set up the entire story and it answers some of the most fundamental questions that human beings can ask. Where did we come from? Our origin? Why are we here? Our purpose? Who am I? Who am I? Who are we? Our identity. And what is wrong with the I mean, something's wrong with the world. Is it you? Is it me? What, like, what is the problem with the world? And Genesis 1 through 11 answers all of those questions. And interestingly enough, this is where we're also introduced to God's plan for saving and redeeming that whole world. He tells the serpent that the seed of the woman, which is an interesting turn of phrase, typically the woman doesn't have the seed, she has the egg. But the seed of the woman, perhaps signifying a, a virgin birth someday, will crush your head, serpent, but you will strike his heel. And we know that one day there's this male offspring of Eve that's going to come and destroy the work of Satan, and we know that is Jesus Christ. And then we moved into the, the, the era of the patriarchs, and this shows God's plan to redeem the whole world. He can't do it through everybody, so he chooses one man, one particular family, Abraham and Abraham's children, uh, Isaac and Jacob and Joseph and Judah, and he chooses this family to be his conduit. Uh, like electricity runs through a conduit to go throughout a whole building. The family of Abraham is the conduit that takes God's blessing to the entire earth. And we know that that was ultimately fulfilled in the person of Jesus Christ, who was called the son of Abraham at the beginning of Matthew. And then we move into this era called redemption. This era shows God's faithfulness. God remembers his people. God remembers his promise. The people of Israel were in captivity, in slavery for 430 years, and God hears their cries, and he rescues them with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm, 10 plagues, and walking through the Red Sea, and bloods of lambs that are put on the doorposts of a house, and God saves the people. He redeems them. And there's this mass exodus, and they go to this mountain where God gives them the law and makes a covenant with Moses. And then they establish worship in the tabernacle. And then they get right to the edge of the promised land, and, and they send in 12 spies to look at the land. And God said, this is the land I've given you. Go and take it. And they go in, and all the spies come back saying, it's too big of a challenge. We can't possibly do this. This is not going to happen. We are like gnats in the sight of these people, except for Joshua and Caleb. But the rest of the crowd convinced the people, and God said, you're going to wander the desert. And that's our next era. They wandered the desert for 40 years until that entire generation died off. And then 
Joshua, we, we get into this next phase where they're finally ready to, to take the promised land. Conquest is the next era. Moses passes the mantle of leadership to Joshua. They go into the promised land. God is faithful to help deliver them from the Canaanite people. And he does it in crazy ways. This is how God tends to work. He saves us in magnificently crazy ways sometimes. He's like, go march around a city seven times. Because I want to prove to you that your salvation is not dependent upon your strength or your ability. It's dependent upon God. And so God saves his people in the promised land. And they, they, they remove most of the Canaanites, but they don't fully obey. God said, hey, go in and, and get rid of all the people. But they don't fully obey, and some of the people were left in the promised land, and they end up negatively influencing Israel, perverting their worship. And this ultimately leads us to the next era, which Sean talked about last week, this era that we're calling apostasy. And it's the time of the judges. And, and, and the key verse in Judges says that during that time, everybody did only what they thought was right in their own eyes. Everybody what was doing whatever they wanted. There was no authority. Their own authority was themselves, and everybody was kind of going around doing their own thing. You do you was the theme of the judges. Sound familiar? And so they, they're, they're going around in this time, and what God would do is, is things would get really bad for the people because of this, because when you disobey God, when you don't follow God, it doesn't work out for you. God wants us to follow him and obey him and love him because he loves us. He wants us to thrive in our lives. And when we don't do that, things don't work out. And the people would cry out to God. And God, because he's merciful and good and kind, he would raise up a judge, Gideon or Deborah or, or, or um, uh, oh, give me another judge. Who's another judge? Throw it out there, people. Samson, Sa the hair guy. Samson, would, would, he would raise these people up and they would deliver the people from Israel and they would follow God for a time until that judge died and then the cycle continued and continued and continued. And that leads us to where we're going today. We're in this, this part that we're calling the kingdom united. The, the Israel is moving from this kind of random group of people and they're forming a kingdom. And, and I'm going to talk about the first part of this this week and then we'll, we'll do the second part next week. But if you have your Bibles, please look with me at 1 Samuel chapter 2 and starting in verse 12 and then I'll kind of skip around just a little bit and we'll go from there. Here's what it says. It says, Eli's sons were scoundrels, and they had no regard for the Lord. But Samuel was ministering before the Lord, a boy wearing a linen ephod. Each year his mother made him a little robe and took it to him when she went up with her husband to offer the annual sacrifice. Eli would bless Elkanah and his wife, saying, May the Lord give you children by this woman to take the place of the one she prayed for and gave to the Lord. Then they would go home, and the Lord was gracious to Hannah. She gave birth to three sons and two daughters. And meanwhile, Samuel, her first son that she dedicated to the Lord, grew up in the presence of the Lord. Now Eli, who was very old, heard about everything that his sons were doing to all of Israel and how they slept with the women who served at the entrance to the tent of meeting. So he said to them, why do you do these things? I hear from all the people about all the wicked things that you've done. No, my sons, the report I hear spreading among the Lord's people is not good. If one person sins against another, God may mediate for the offender. But if you sin against God, who will mediate for you? His sons, however, did not listen to their father's rebuke, and it was the Lord's will to put them to death. And the boy Samuel continued to grow in stature and in favor with the Lord and with his people. This is God's word. Amen? Give me an amen from your living room. Amen. Amen? Good. Okay, so the overarching narrative of this section, I'm going to go there first, and we're going to kind of drill into what we just talked about. The overarching narrative of this section of scripture is that God is establishing a kingdom. God is raising up a king. And specifically, he says, he wants a king who is after his own heart, one who has a heart like him, one who follows him and loves him. And he eventually, we eventually find out that, that king is David, a man named David. And God promises David that he will have an offspring that will reign on his throne for eternity. And this should propel us forward into the the future parts of our series. That's kind of what's going on here in the meta-narrative of this 
story. But today, just looking at the first part of this Kingdom United, there are two characters that I want to look at that really serve as kind of an outline for us today. And the first character is the namesake of the book. It's, what's his name? Samuel. His name is Samuel. As, as first Samuel begins, we see a man named Eli who was serving as priest. And he was probably the judge for the people during this time as well. So Eli is a priest and a judge for the people of Israel. And Eli had two sons, Hophni and Phinehas. And these were not good dudes. In fact, it says they were scoundrels. I don't, I've never been called a scoundrel personally, but it doesn't sound great. They were scoundrels who treated the Lord's offering with contempt. They were sleeping with the women who served at the entrance to the tent of meeting. Now, now remember, the tent of meeting is the place where Moses spoke face to face with God as one speaks with a friend. And here we have Hophni and Phinehas desecrating this holy place that God had established. And it's in reading this and and, and looking at Eli and his sons that we see, hey, we are still firmly entrenched in the time of the judges. Hophni and Phinehas are still doing what they think is right in their own eyes. And it's in the middle of this leadership crisis. And maybe we've been in some leadership crises at, at different points in our lives. It's in the middle of this leadership crisis that a woman named Hannah, who was unable to have children, prayed earnestly to God and asked him to open her womb. And guess what? He did. He miraculously and supernaturally gave her a child and she named him Samuel because she said, I asked God for him. And she said, Lord, if you give me this child, I will give him back to you. I will dedicate him to you all the days of his life. Now, we, we could do a whole Mother's Day sermon on Hannah, I don't have time for that today, but I do want you to take a second and just just notice this. Consider the faith that it would require to struggle with infertility your entire life, and then to ask God to plead to him to give me a child, and then she gets pregnant, and then to turn around and give that child back to God. In fact, it says, when Samuel was old enough, when he was weaned, she took him to the temple to be raised by the priest, by Eli. By the way, by a priest who didn't have a great track record with raising boys. So Hannah had this amazing faith, and God ends up blessing her with other children. It tells us that Samuel grew up in the presence of the Lord, and that he grew in stature and favor with the Lord and with people. And it's in this contrast between Eli's wicked sons and Samuel that we see that there's this transition happening for the people of Israel. There's this transition from the time of the judges to a time of new leadership. Eli's sons did what was right in their own eyes, but Samuel had favor from the Lord. Favor from the Lord. And maybe one of the most well-known events from Samuel's life comes very early on in chapter 3 of 1 Samuel. It's the calling of Samuel, 1 Samuel chapter 3. Let's start in verse 1. Let me just read some of it to you. It says this, The boy Samuel, so he's just a boy at this time, ministered before the Lord under Eli. In those days, the word of the Lord was rare, and there were not many visions. I, I wonder if there is some sort of correlation between people and their leaders not seeking God and a lack of prophetic word from God or dreams from God. I wonder if that's, that's true. Verse 2, One night Eli, whose eyes were becoming weak so that he could barely see, was lying down in his usual place, and the lamp of God had not yet gone out, and Samuel was lying down in the house of the Lord where the ark of God was. Then the Lord said to Samuel, Samuel. And Samuel said, Here I am. And he got up and he ran to Eli and said, hey, you called me. And Eli said, I didn't call you. Go back to bed. What are you doing? It's what I do when my kids get up in the middle. Like, why are you up right now? <laughs> Go back to bed. But this happened two more times. Samuel lays down and, says, and he hears Samuel and Samuel gets up. And then finally, by the third time, Eli realizes God is trying to speak to this boy. And so Samuel is told this by Eli. Next time you hear the Lord calling, go lie down. And if he calls you, say, speak, Lord, your servant is listening. And so Samuel laid down. And then verse 10 says, the Lord came and stood there. It's an interesting thing to note. 
calling out as the other times, Samuel, Samuel. And Samuel said, speak, Lord, your servant is listening. And it's at this point that Samuel is given a prophetic word about Eli and his family, that God is going to bring judgment on Hophni and Phinehas and all of the house of Eli. And uh, that is his first word he gets from God as a young boy. And it's really interesting because uh, Eli asks him the next morning, hey, what did God tell you? Must have been an awkward moment, right? Hey, what did God tell you, man? Uh, oh, your whole family is going to be judged by God and destroyed. Like that, it's, it takes a lot of boldness, and it says that Samuel was maybe a little afraid to speak truth to power, but he did. He spoke God's truth to Eli, and thankfully, Eli was the kind of person who said, may it be as the Lord says. But the point I want to make for you here is this. Samuel listened to God. Samuel listened to to God. Now, this might not seem like earth-shattering advice for you, but in a time when nobody listens, in a time when all we ever do is think about what we're going to say to the person who's next to us, in a time when nobody was listening to anybody else, everybody was doing what was right, this young boy listened to God. And I had a mentor who told me this past week that, that there are really kind of four stages to the life of prayer. And he laid it out like this. He said, the first stage is talking at God, like he's a divine slot machine. I'm going to talk at you, God. The second stage is talking to God. At this point, you, there is some kind of relationship here, and you're talking to him and not at him. The third stage is listening to God. This is where the conversation becomes two-way. And then finally, it's being with God, being with God. This is a more relational experience. And so he doesn't want us to talk at him or just talk to him. He wants us to listen and to be with him. And, uh, you know, sometimes we seem so enamored by 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 prayers where, where we're speaking to God or asking God. There was this book that sold several years ago called The Prayer of Jabez. You guys remember this book? It's a great little book, great prayer. Bruce Wilkins and I appreciate it. Good. It's good to pray that prayer. But, but, but I wonder how often we are content praying the prayer of Jabez. Oh, Lord, bless me indeed. Stretch my territory. But we are not content to pray Samuel's prayer. Lord, speak. Your servant is listening. In a world where everyone is doing what is right in their own eyes, listening is a revolutionary act. Now, now, now you may be saying, hey, I'm, just, I'm not great at listening. I got a little ADD. I get a little distracted. I'm not a great listener. And, and here's what I'll say to you. Yes, you are. You're great at listening to whatever you have made priority to listening to in your life. Um, and, and it could be, you, uh, do you have a cell phone? Can I have a cell phone? Someone throw me one. Yeah, it could be you taking a phone and you look at your phone and you say, speak, Lord, your servant is listening. Or it could be you tuning in to your favorite cable news station and watching the talking heads feed you all of the things and you say, speak, Lord, your servant is listening. We're good at listening. We're just not good at prioritizing what we should listen to or to whom we should listen. And what God is saying is, listen to me. Listen to me. And, and, and we see this kind of listening modeled in the life of Jesus. Mark 1.35, it says, Very early in the morning, while it was still dark, Jesus got up, left the house, and he went to a quiet place where he prayed. Jesus listened to God. John 5, 19 says, Jesus only did what the Father was doing. And I wonder how often we are controlled by the ping, the ding, the notification, instead of by the voice of God who wants to speak to us. And so my challenge for you is prioritize what you're listening to. Everybody's listening to something. What are you listening to? And I, and I, and I would say, Make it a daily habit to pray Samuel's prayer, to wake up and may the first thing on your mind and the first thing out of your mouth be, speak, Lord, your servant is listening. It's an incredible challenge. So Samuel was a prophet because he spoke for God. 
He had to listen first. Samuel was a priest because he offered sacrifices for God and called the people to repentance. But Samuel was also the last judge of Israel. We read that in uh, 1 Samuel 7. And, and he led the people into military victory. And so Samuel was a prophet, a priest, and a judge. No other character in the Old Testament occupied those three seats of authority. And perhaps this is foreshadowing another ruler, another leader who would come, and he would be a prophet who spoke for God. And he would be a priest who didn't just offer sacrifices, but was the sacrifice. And he wouldn't be a judge, he'd be a king. And his name was Jesus. And so we see Jesus foreshadowed in the life of Samuel. Next, let's, let's talk about Saul. And we're going to have to go fast. Um, 1 Samuel chapter 8, the people of Israel, they begin to moan. They're like, oh, we want to be like everybody else. We want to be like all the other nations. We want a king. Give us a king, Samuel. And, and Samuel's like, you don't want a king. You don't want a, a king will tax you. A king will take your sons and make them serve in his army. A king will take your daughters. They're going to be maids and cooks. You don't want a king. And they said, we want a king. We want someone to rule over us, to defeat our enemies for us. And meanwhile, God's over there going like, what, like, what have I been doing? And, and, and so God relents and he says, give them a king. Give them what they ask for. That's fine. And so he raises up this man named Saul. And the beginning of Saul's life was, was, was pretty impressive. It tells us several things. Let me just read them. He was a man of standing. 1 Samuel chapter 9, verse 1. He was a man of great standing. He had influence and wealth. Maybe he was a person of valor. He was a man of stature. It says he was so handsome that no one in Israel could be found like him. Uh, and he was a head taller than everybody else. He, he looked the part of a king. Uh, he was a man of humility, at least at first. Uh, 1 Samuel 9.21, it says that Saul, when, when he's asked to be king from Samuel, he said, but am I not a Benjamite from the smallest tribe, and is not my clan the least cl uh, clan in this tribe of Benjamin? So he had this humility, it seems like, at least at first. And then, uh, most importantly of all, 1 Samuel 10.10, 10, he is a man endowed with the Spirit of God, uh, Samuel tells him, the spirit of the Lord is going to powerfully come upon you and you will prophesy and you will be changed into a different person. Sounds impressive. Kind of had all the right ingredients to be a good king. But I want to tell you, Sam, uh, uh, Saul had a fatal flaw when it came to his leadership and his kingliness. And his flaw was fear. Fear fear. Rudyard Kipling once said, of all the liars in the world, sometimes the worst is our own fear. Jimmy Stewart, It's a Wonderful Life, he said this, fear is an insidious, deadly thing. It can warp judgment, freeze reflexes, breed mistakes, and worst of all, it's contagious. And if we see hints, we, we, we see hints of this fear very early on in, in, in uh, Saul's rule, during his coronation, they can't find him. They're like, where is Saul? We can't find Saul. It's in 1 Samuel 10. And it turns out he's hiding in the supply closet. God has told him, you're the man, you're the king, I've chosen you. And he's, it, this is not like Gideon. Gideon's already hiding in the closet and comes out when God calls him. God calls Saul and then he goes into the closet. He's afraid. It's interesting. So we see this hint of fear, and there are really two types of fear that I think cost Saul his kingdom. And the first one is fear of failure. None of us struggle with that, do we? Fear of failure. In 1 Samuel 13, we see Saul and the Israelites, they're outnumbered, they're outgunned by the Philistines. Samuel had told Saul, hey, wait here, I'm going to come in seven days, I'll offer a sacrifice, then the army will go out and you will defeat them, bing, bang, boom, no problem. But what happened was seven days had passed, uh, Samuel hadn't shown up, and the men began to scatter, it says in 1 Samuel 13. They began to chatter maybe a little bit. They were afraid. What if God isn't with us? And, and what if this man of God doesn't show up and he doesn't bless us? And so they start scattering in fear. And in a move of self-protection, Saul says, you know what? I, I, will, I, will, I will do the sacrifice. I will 
uh, offer the burnt offering to the Lord. And he does. And then Samuel shows up. And here's what he says in verse 11 of 1 Samuel 13. What have you done? Asked Samuel. Samuel, Saul replied, when I saw the men were scattering and that you hadn't come uh, and the Philistines were assembled, I thought that, that I should just do the burnt offering. I thought that was my, my thing. And Samuel says, you have done a foolish thing. You have not kept the command. The Lord, only priests gave sacrifice. And, and Saul put himself in a position that God never put him in. And Samuel says this, I grieve for Saul. He says, if you had not kept the command of the Lord, he gave you. Uh, if you had kept the command, he would have established your kingdom for all time. Oh, what a gut punch. But now your kingdom will not endure, for the Lord has sought a man after his own heart and appointed him ruler over his people, because you have not kept the Lord's commands. And so he, because he was afraid of losing the battle, because he was afraid of failing, he took matters into his own hands, and he sacrificed the burnt offering. And, and I think sometimes initiative is fear in disguise. I'm going to take initiative. I'm going to take the bull by the horns. I'm going to make it happen. But our initiative sometimes is our fear uh, being afraid to wait, being afraid to wait on God and listen for his instruction. And then the second type of fear that I think ruins Saul's kingdom is fear of man. God gave Saul a really clear command. He says, I want you to, des to destroy the Amalekites, a wicked nation, who attacked Israel during their exodus from Egypt. And, and, and God's command was that the Amalekites would be totally destroyed. Every person, every animal, everything belonging to the Amalekites wiped off the face of the earth. Why God would ask him to do this, that's a talk for another day. I would love to chat with you about that. If you want to send a message, we can do it. We can, we can have a conversation about it. I don't have all the answers. But God said, do this. And so 1 Samuel 15 says, Saul went and attacked the Amalekites. And on his way there, he took Agag, the king of the Amalekites, and he took him alive as a prisoner, but he totally destroyed uh, lots of other things with the sword. But Saul spared Agag, the king, and he spared the best of the sheep and the cattle and the fat calves and everything that was good, but he destroyed everything that was weak or detestable or despised. I call this selective obedience. He was obedience only to the point where he thought he should, you know what, I'm, I'm going to obey what I think I should and the rest, I'm going to, you know, it's one of those gray areas left open for interpretation. He was selectively obeying or partially obeying. And then because of this, verse 10 says, the word of the Lord came to Samuel and said, I regret that I have made Saul king because he has turned away from me and has not carried out my instructions. This is the same phrase that's used in Genesis 6 when God says, I regret that I made humanity because they're so sinful and wicked. God was the heart of God was grieved at the obstinate disobedience of this man that he anointed king. Verse 20. But I did obey the Lord, Saul said. I, I went on the mission, and I completely destroyed the Amalekites. And I brought back Agag. You, do you see the self-deception that starts happening when we get in this spot? He, no, you didn't completely destroy. The soldiers took the sheep and the cattle, and what, what, we were going to offer a sacrifice to you, God. But Samuel replied, does the Lord delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as much as obeying the Lord? To obey is better than sacrifice, and to heed is better than fat rams, and rebellion is like the sin of divination, and arrogance like the evil of idolatry. Because you have rejected the word of the Lord, God has rejected you as king. Verse 24, Saul said, I have sinned. I violated the Lord's command. And then he tells us why. What does he say? It's right there in verse 24. He says, I was afraid of the men, so I gave in to them. Whew. Partial obedience is disobedience. Partial obedience is disobedience. And, and when we are more concerned about what 
man or men or people think, then we will be less concerned about what God thinks. Proverbs 29, 25, the fear of man will prove to be a snare, but whoever trusts in the Lord is kept safe. And it's for this reason that God stripped the kingdom away from him and gave it to a man after his own heart. He took the spirit of God away from Saul and gave it to David, who we'll talk about next week. And I think it's really interesting. David goes on, uh, he, he's kind of a mixed bag as well. He has his own versions of sin. After David sins later on with Bathsheba, he writes Psalm 51. And in Psalm 51, David writes, Lord, please don't take your spirit from me. You know why he said that? Because he saw God do this to this man, Saul. Partial obedience is disobedience. And so the lesson we learn from Samuel is to listen. Speak, Lord, your servant is listening. And the lesson we learn from Saul is to obey. And the person of Jesus Christ is the ultimate example of both of these things. Jesus was fully tuned in to God. He was God. He did only what the Father was doing. And Jesus was the only one who was perfectly obedient. If you think that Christianity is trying to climb some ladder of moral perfection in order to get to God, you've missed the point. That's not the message of the gospel. The message of the gospel is God climbed down the ladder and he lived a perfect life on your behalf and then died on a cross. In fact, Philippians 2.8 says, And being found in human form, he humbled himself, becoming obedient even to the point of death on a cross. Jesus was not afraid of failure, even though it looked like failure was staring him right in the eyes. Jesus was not afraid afraid of men, of people, even though these men, these people, had his fate in their hands. Jesus trusted God, not my will, but your will be done. And so as we go back into a time of worship and communion, I just want to leave you with just a really practical question, something that I hope is insanely practical for you. One, you may be watching this broadcast and and, and you have some curiosity about Christianity. Maybe maybe you've had some experience with Christianity. Most of the time what I'm finding in the West and and post-Christian cultures is that you've had negative experience with Christianity. But I want you to know that Jesus, Jesus loves you and is pursuing you. And he's not only dying for you and loving you, he's waiting to listen to you, to call out to him. And he wants you to listen to him as he gives you directives for your life that will lead you to hope and peace and flourishing. And so if you're curious about this Christianity thing and you've never really bought in, I just challenge you to consider Jesus. He climbed the ladder down for us. And then the second thing is, and maybe this is for those of us who would say that we're believers, is is what, uh, how do you need to respond to God in obedience? What has God called you to do? Or what has the Spirit prompted you to do? Maybe you have have been afraid of failure, so you haven't done it. Or maybe you've been afraid of man, human beings, trite as they are. We we, uh, live and die based on their opinions sometimes. But if we live by the applause of man, we will die by the criticism of man. And God wants you to only be concerned with what he thinks about you. And so how is he calling you to obey There's an old hymn that says something like this, but we never can prove the delights of his love until all on the altar we lay for the favor he shows and the joy he bestows are for them who will trust and obey. Let me pray. God, thank you for your word, which is alive, it's active, it's sharp, it's penetrating heart soul, bone, marrow, spirit, all the things. 
And Lord, you are working on each of, there are people watching this stream, right? you are working on that there is a God in the universe, that we are not a random spinning ball of mass, that there is purpose and beauty and direction to this world, and it all got spun by a creator. And I pray that today, Lord, that we would listen to your voice. We'd listen. We'd listen to so many other things, but we would say to you, speak, Lord, your servants are listening. And God, I pray that we would obey. Not partial obedience, not selective obedience, but fully obey. Chasing after you, our beloved. It's in your name we pray, amen.